Greetings, and bienvenue, mine crew. Thank you for returning to this broadcast. And welcome to new viewers joining us for the first time. If you like a video, then feel free to subscribe. Get a job in the middle of nowhere, Alaska. So remote they fly me in by helicopter and drop off supplies every two weeks the same way. The job is maintaining a weather monitoring station and radio repeater. Have a radio I can contact somebody with if there's an emergency, but help is hours away in a best case scenario. There's supposed to be two people there at all times, but the guy I'm with sliced his leg open, chopping firewood and gets evacuated. They can't find anybody to replace him, but I'm fine being alone. Besides, they let me bring my dog, she can keep me company. Small Catahoula leopard dog named Pepper. Spend my time checking the equipment, chopping firewood and exploring the area. Always bring my SML No. 4 Mk1 rifle and 41 Magnum revolver in case of bears. See exactly one bear the entire time I'm there. And his fat ass didn't give a shit about me or Pepper. He was getting ready to hibernate. Winter is coming. JPG. The weather forecast says the first big storm of the winter is coming. So I lock down all the shutters on the windows of the cabin, cover my firewood with a tarp, and hunker down for the night. Wake up freezing my ass off, wind howling and making the cabin creak, and Pepper trying to burrow into my skin for warmth. The potbelly stove went out. Load more firewood and get the stove going again. The cabin is still colder than my stepmom's love for me, so I open the chimney flue and start the fireplace as well. The cabin finally starts to warm up. Check the weather. It's negative 20. Holy shit. It never gets that cold back home. Ponder that the only thing keeping me from dying right now is my firewood. Hope I chopped enough. Start to head back to bed when I hear creaking on the porch. Doesn't sound like the wind. Sounds like someone or something walking on the porch. Go stand by the front door to listen. I can't see outside because the window shutters are all closed, not opening the door because of the freezing temperature. I don't hear anything more, shrug and go back to bed. Spend the next day shoveling snow and chopping more firewood. If I'm going to be stuck here for a couple months, I don't want to freeze to death. Pepper having a blast romping in the snow. Next night, have the cabin nice and toasty with a fire crackling in the fireplace and stove. Cook a dinner of beef stew and pilot bread for me. Hot gravy train for Pepper. Watching Z Gundam on my laptop. Pause the episode to get another bowl of stew. Hmm. I think tomorrow I'll make potato soup with bacon. Winter always gets me in the mood for soup, stew, or chili for some reason. Walking back to the couch with a bowl of stew in one hand, a mug of apple cider in the other. Suddenly hear a loud creak on the porch. Definitely not my imagination. Pepper heard it too and is staring at the door. It's not very windy tonight either. Set food down and listen by the door. There's another creak. Pepper begins growling while staring at the door. I'm not opening the door. It's too damn cold and it's just some animal anyway. Go back to watching my animus finish dinner. Call it a night. The next morning, the tarp has been pulled off my firewood and I find it in a heap at the fireside of the clearing where the helicopter lands. Couldn't have blown off. It was tied down. Figure whatever animal was on the porch pulled it off for some reason. Put the tarp back, ensure it's tied down securely. Pepper running all over the place, sniffing the ground excitedly. Seems focused on the porch, the edge of the woods, and where I found the tarp. The barometer stopped recording, figured out what the problem was, and got it working like the rest of the weather station. Firewood rack is full. Weather station is all good again. I have nothing to do for the rest of the day grab a rifle and traipse through the woods with Pepper. She keeps sniffing the ground excitedly, then running ahead to sniff more. Suddenly points at something in the brush and growls. Call her in case it's a bear or moose or something else that'll tear her up. Doesn't respond. Barking and growling aggressively now. Call her again. Something moves through the brush, snapping a branch and Pepper races over to me. Watch for a minute to make sure I'm not going to get charged by a moose, then head back to the cabin. Wake up in the middle of the night, freezing again. Wind howling. Head into the main room of the cabin. The stove has gone out. The fireplace is still going, but has gotten low. Toss in more wood. Get the stove going again. Check the weather. It's negative 20-something and snowing heavily. I don't feel like going back to sleep yet, so I make a mug of hot chocolate 
sit on the couch and read a book, hear loud creaking on the porch. Something is definitely walking back and forth on the porch. Screw it. I want to know what kind of animal it is. Grab my revolver, put on my jacket, unlock the door, and peek outside. Immediately get blasted in the face by wind. I can't see shit outside. Close the door again. Figure whatever animal it is is just taking shelter on the porch, although that's a bad place to do it. Go back to reading. Creaking starts up again. Ignore it. Just got to the good part. Knock, knock, knock. Jump out of my skin and tactically shit myself at the sudden sound of loud knocking on the door. It's 1 a.m. negative 20, snowing like a blizzard, and 100 miles from the nearest human being with dense woods and rugged terrain all around. Who the hell could be knocking on my door? More knocking. Grab my revolver and stare at the door in surprise. Pepper comes running in and stares at the door. Knock, knock, knock. The knocking is just as loud, but spaced out this time as if for emphasis. That is definitely a person and not an animal. Hello? No answer. Who's there? No answer. Pepper growling and staring at the door. Whoever is out there is probably in trouble, being in the middle of nowhere, late at night in this weather. How did they find the cabin, though? There's no lights visible from outside, and you're not randomly stumbling across it in the dark during a snowstorm. It has to be someone who knew it was here before they came. Walk over to the door, but don't unlock it. Hello? Still no answer. This is weird. You'd think if whoever it was was in some kind of emergency, they'd be talking back to me. Cock hammer on revolver, even though logically it's unnecessary. Unlock door and open it, immediately blasted by wind and snow. Holy shit, it's freezing. Look around with my flashlight. See no sign of anyone on the porch. Yell hello a few more times, no response. I'm not stepping off the porch. In this weather, I could get lost easily and freeze to death. Step back inside and lock the door. That was weird. Sit back down. Too creeped out to go to bed or go back to reading. Hear creaking on the porch again. Go stand by the door. Knock, knock, knock. That is definitely a person knocking. Yank the door open. There's nobody there. Is some asshole hunter really fucking with me by playing ding-dong ditch in the middle of the night in this weather? Wait by the door, jacket on, gun in hand. Hear the creaking as whoever it is is walking across the porch toward the door. Just as I judge they're right outside the door, I yank it open and point my revolver at absolutely nothing. Nobody is there. This is creeping me the hell out. Go back inside, toss another log in the fireplace and contemplate my options. I can radio for help, but they can't fly out here in this weather and would just think I'm a crazy punk who can't handle being alone in the dark. I can stumble around in the dark during a snowstorm and probably die. Or I can sit in the cabin. I sit in the cabin. Pepper starts growling before I hear the porch creaking again. Creaking goes on for a good minute, as whoever is out there paces back and forth. Finally another loud knock and Pepper starts barking. Yank the door open, shine the flashlight around, nobody is there. Screw this. Fire around into the darkness and yell for whoever is out there to quit fucking around. Go back inside, lock the door and shove the table up against it in case some lunatic tries to break in. Go to bed but stay dressed, minus shoes and keep my revolver on the nightstand next to me after replacing the spent round. Nothing happens for the rest of the night. The next morning, the tarp is missing again. No footprints in the snow because it's four feet deep and was snowing all night. Get on the radio and ask when I'm getting a replacement for my partner. They haven't got anybody. Very few people volunteer for this shit and don't want to send one of the other pair of guys out here because they're supposed to take my place once my time is up and that would keep the guy out here for way too long. Ask if there's any hunting cabins or other people in the area. There's a long pause, followed by, no, why? Tell them I heard something and thought it might be another person. Was it someone knocking on the door? Holy shit. Yeah, how did you know? Get told it's nothing to worry about, don't open the door and just ignore it if I hear it again. Refuses to elaborate further. Go to bed thoroughly disturbed. Clearly the knocking happens often enough that other people report it. And clearly the source is either unknown or they don't want to tell me. That's comforting. Hard to sleep staring at the ceiling and petting the dog while she snores. 
Knock, knock, knock. I don't move. Just pretend I don't hear the knocking. Knock, knock, knock. Go away. I'm asleep. Knock, knock, knock. Holy shit, who is this asshole? Knock, knock, knock. Walk to the door. Yank it open and crank off all six shots from my revolver and scream for whoever it is to go off himself. Shut and lock the door, reload the revolver, and grab my rifle. The next time he knocks, I'm shooting through the door as he does it. No knocking for the rest of the night. I eventually get tired as the adrenaline wears off and go back to bed. The next morning, radio in and tell them to send my two replacements out here. I'm done with this shit. They tell me to pack up. They'll come get me tomorrow and drop off my replacements. No knocking that night. A helicopter comes around noon the next day. Two guys get out, quiz me on the weather station and other equipment, then help me load my stuff into the chopper. I don't mention the knocking. Pepper and I fly back to the airport. I get paid for my time in the cabin and fly back home. That's it. I never saw anything. No Wendigo, no Sasquatch, no Skinwalker, no crazed axe murderer, just weird knocking on the door of a remote cabin in the Alaskan wilderness, in the middle of the night in a snowstorm. Fucking weird. I'll recount a story from my childhood. I won't green text it and it's not even scary or creepypasta worthy, but there's no other threads to really share it, so whatever. As a kid I used to sleep in my mom's room with my sister. We'd go to bed at a normal time for children, fall asleep, and a few hours later or whatever, my mom would carry us to our own beds and go to sleep herself. She would also keep the light on because my sister was afraid of the dark, and it didn't bother me so I didn't mind having it on. One night I was having difficulty falling asleep so I turned on my back and stared up at the ceiling. I was drawn to the light, and my eyes caught a glimmer of movement in the corner. As I focused on the corner of the ceiling light, I saw the shadow of a man moving around. It was very clear and defined. I could make out his arms, his legs. I was even able to make out a hat sitting atop his head. The motions he was making weren't very sensical. He was just sort of flailing his arms and moving around like one would if they were walking in an exaggerated manner. He never left the corner and never did more than moving his limbs, but I watched him for a couple hours, completely entranced. My eyes were fixed on that light, completely focused on the shadow, until eventually I fell asleep. I didn't tell my mom about it, but the next night I told my sister and told her to stay awake with me and see if it showed up. Naturally, it didn't, and she fell asleep soon after telling me I was mean for joking around with her. I felt like I was crazy, but I gave up and went to sleep too, and I thought that would be the end of it. But it wasn't, because he showed up again the next night, doing the same weird dance and motions. I tried waking my sister up to show her, but by the time she opened her eyes and looked at the light, he was gone. But I knew he was real, and for the next few years, a couple of times a week, I would stay up late into the night, watching a shadow man on my ceiling light entertain me by doing silly little dances. I tried a couple more times to get my sister to see it, but it never happened. That's pretty much it. By the time I turned 10 or 11 or something, I stopped sleeping in my mom's room. I didn't keep my light on either, and I never tried turning on my own light and seeing if he would appear. Even though it didn't feel malicious, I didn't really want to. I felt like it was something I couldn't get rid of. I enjoyed watching him, but at the same time I felt so entranced and hypnotized by his movements that I would fixate on him and stay up until my body shut down on its own. I never saw him again, and nowadays it's just a memory. One I can picture as clear as day, though. I can reenact his weird routines in my head very clearly. But still, just a memory. I was on a ferry for a school softball trip off Kodiak Island, Alaska in May 2014. I was 18. Many of us had snuck up to the deck around 11 p.m. to watch the waves, smoke cigarettes, and generally be teenagers on a boat without supervision. The sun was about to set, but it was still bright outside so we're just doing our thing and notice a pod of orcas swimming with the fairy's wake, which is very cool but not unusual. If you're familiar with the dimensions of an orca fin, you know they're about four to six feet in height and look like big black spikes coming out of the water. They travel and hunt in pods of anywhere between 15 to 40 whales, apex predators, the beautiful demon murderers of the sea, top of the food chain. 
So we saw a pod of orcas and counted them to be around 10 to 15, with some babies scattered in there. Very fun to watch. It took them a good 30 minutes to all go by. We tried to get pictures, but it was just dark enough that our phone cameras weren't very good. Another 30 or 40 minutes go by and we've all pretty much sobered up, and it's about to get dark, and we're cold and sleepy and about ready to go in. No more orcas, haven't seen one for like half an hour, and then one of my JV girls spots another one. So we all turn and look, but one dorsal fin is immediately followed by another and another and another and then two more and then two more after that in two separate rows, and they're taller by a lot, and jagged, like some, have whole chunks torn out of them, and they're all eight, ten feet high, and they're all attached to one creature, and we can just barely see its back slicing through the water, covered in these rows of spikes, and it just keeps coming. This thing is like twenty or thirty feet from the ferry, running parallel to it, and we are all transfixed. There's like nine or ten of us, and no one is saying a word, because we've all turned to look at a whale and we are all now watching something that is like, horrifically, terrifyingly, and obviously, not a whale. Someone tries to take a picture but it's too dark at this point, and the only reason we can see this thing is the light cast from fairy portholes. I really wish you had a picture of it. But we all stand there, completely scared, stiff, and in awe, and we watch this thing just keep surfacing for a good six or seven minutes, which means that whatever it was, was long. Like sixty or seventy feet long or longer, and covered in enormous spikes. It took what felt like an eternity for any of us to say anything after the last of it disappeared back into the strait. I mean, if you and like eight of your friends had just all seen something that all science had definitely pointed to not exist, and you had all seen the same exact thing, and it was very obviously trailing, nay, hunting, not one but fifteen-something apex predators, what do you even say to break that silence? That's the thing that eats me about the whole thing is it was hunting. It was following them. It was literally hunting about 60 tons of toothy, angry whales. Every once in a while, one of us will hit another one of us up and check in like, do you remember this? Was I hallucinating? Did we all see the same insane, worldview-melting, terrifying thing that night? And the reason I know we did is that none of us talked about it after that. Not during the trip. Not after, not to any of our friends, because how do you even tell someone about something like that? Now we have almost ten years between us, and that night I assume some of them have probably told people. I know I tell people because I've seen a lot of strange things like that in Alaska. Also, there's a very rich history among native Alaskans of something that lives and hunts in the waters around Kodiak. And it's important to tell its story because someday it's going to eat a little too much plastic and no one will ever watch it hunt a pod of orcas from a boat ever again. Be young Shitlin. Dad's a crabber, so we're a coastal family. Thus, I live in some remote Alaskan village. Only a handful of white people. Natives. Natives everywhere. Regardless, I heard very cool stories. Land otters, demons in the woods, spirits of good and evil, etc. Etc. We live in an old wooden house. The house itself was decrepit, but the surrounding area was beautiful. The house rested by a river, and the ocean was a few hundred yards away. This village only had a mile of road and maintained roughly 500 people, so it was incredibly remote. The reason it even existed was because of an abandoned cannery at the end of town that used to be a prime stop for salmon tenders. While the island is remote, it is also between two very busy fisheries and saw a lot of action in its prime. Regardless, money became an issue and the cannery fell into disuse, and as such, the coastal village went with it. As time went on, more and more people left. There's a large amount of dilapidated houses and inns dotting the little village, making the place look sad and desolate. Basically, what I'm trying to say is, it was a miserable and lonely place full of old memories of a once busy fishing community. So when my family got there, it was a bittersweet moving in. However, rent was cheap, the experience was timeless, and I learned a good bit of survival and fishing techniques. I also had my first paranormal experience there, and it terrified me. One night I was watching cartoons on my parents' bed. The room was odd. Odd because it had a hallway-esque extension that served as the laundry room. Because of how they set up their bed, it was just a few feet away from its lower end. There was a doorway, 
a sharp 90-degree turn, and then the washer and dryer. Their TV rested on a shelf on the adjacent wall to the laundry room, making the doorway sit right on my peripheral. Anyways, I was in the midst of binge-watching cartoons when something very big and white shifted in the corner of my eyes, right in the laundry room doorway. I turned my head in innocent fear to see what I can only describe as a big, translucent sphere hovering right in the middle of the 90-degree turn. I kind of sat there transfixed on this blob as it slowly hovered its way further into the hallway towards the washer-dryer and out of sight. Being a kid at the time being, I hurled the covers off and booked it out of their room without looking back. This blob that I can only assume was a ghost is a very strong memory of mine and gives me the chills whenever I think about it. It was most definitely there, and I believe if I had ran my hands through it, I would have felt something. My mother thinks she saw the very same glowing ball, and my younger brother believes a hand pressed through his mattress into his back one night. I actually remember him asking me if I was messing with him. I've been in Alaska for more than two years and I'm stationed in Fort Wainwright. Every so often we go to field missions and where we go is super isolated. Me and a few guys were tasked to drive down this mountain that we are currently doing our training on and we replied yes, reluctantly, because we just wanted some real food rather than the MREs we have been living off of for the past few days. While two of the soldiers were ground guiding me and my battle I'll call Knox out of the runway, we noticed it started to get dark. Fast. Being on that mountain is hardly ever any light unless it's from the moon. But just to get a general idea, you could see the northern lights easily. As we drive, Knox is telling me he has to urinate really bad so I just tell him to pull over. As he began to pull over, it got extremely quiet. I felt as if someone punched me in my gut because I started to get this strong sense of something watching me and I started to get goosebumps. I took it with a grain of salt that maybe it was just the MRE making my stomach hurt and the weather making the hairs on my skin stand. But then I felt paranoid and I've never felt this way before in the field because I've been here numerous times before. As he walks back to the truck I see the foliage on my right hand side fall as if weight was being forced on it. I tap Knox's shoulder and tell him to look in my direction. It was a moose, but it looked oddly skinny and the antlers just didn't look normal. Our eyes got huge and he responded, What the hell is that thing? I stammered because I wasn't too sure what it was either. He buckled up and pressed the brake, but we heard help, coming from the direction of the moose. My heart dropped and I felt the heat leave my face and I looked at him asking, Did you hear that or was it just me? He replied, Bruh, I heard that. He laughed nervously and we turned off the truck and shined our headlamps towards the moose's direction. We are 89B, so we carry our standard M4S with us in the vehicle when we are transporting ammo, whether there is anything in the cans or not, just because it's for our safety. Knox and I looked in the cab to just verify we had our weapons on us, and we did. I jumped out of the cab and he followed with our headlamps still on the moose. We walked closer and the word help was getting louder and louder. We got a few more feet closer, but not extremely too close to the moose, and it ran back into the wood line, making me and Knox jump. We looked at each other, and we were both probably thinking the same thing. Did that moose just cry for help? I told him I was getting cold, and he agreed. So we paced back to the truck as fast as possible. As I closed the door, we heard the words help, but louder than what it was earlier. I got that gut feeling right after I heard the words and looked into the dark wood line and saw red eyes. I gulped and told him to look, but he put the truck in drive and sped off. We talked for a few minutes about the situation and complete silence followed right after. When we got done with the mission, he sped up the mountain to get back to where the rest of the company was, and he didn't say a word. He sleeps on the cot next to me, and he didn't speak to anyone about the situation. I'm a bit shaken by the situation myself. Whatever it was that called for help, I'm sorry I never went into the wood line. Be maintenance contractor for a large industrial facility. We get the job to paint the training center. Do it at night because people are too oblivious to notice a wet paint sign and caution tape. Place is completely empty. Everyone has to leave by 3.30 per company policy. We show up at 4. I set up a scaffold about 5 feet high and 60 feet long down a stretch of hallway I'll be working on all night. 
The place is dead silent all night aside from the sound of brushes, ladders, rollers, and the occasional toilet flush, all from my work crew. 3 a.m., walking down the scaffold inspecting my work. All of a sudden walk past an open door to a dark room. Get the hell out of my way. Nearly fall off the scaffold. An old dude standing a few feet into the room. Have to break down a section of scaffold to let him through. No way to get past otherwise. It clicks that not only did this dude violate security policy, he's been in that dark room for at least 11 hours straight without me noticing him. He walks past towards the exit. Expect to hear badge reader noise. He's required to swipe it before exiting the building. Hear the door open and shut, but no beeps. I realize I might have to report this dude to security or risk losing my job. Run down the hallway to try to catch the dude in the parking lot, see a member of my crew. Did that guy badge before he left? What guy? Guy says he's been there all night and the only person that went outside was the foreman for smoke breaks. I never reported it and never got asked about it. We were there another week and I never saw that guy again. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. If you enjoyed tonight's story, then please subscribe to the channel as more green texts will appear daily. A new broadcast will appear when the clock strikes midnight central time. Remember to check the Odyssey and Rumble pages for separate archives of previous broadcasts.